we'll get started now. Thanks for um, joining us for Smile Shares with Primary Care. Uh, this month we're focused on breast cancer because uh, it's certainly Breast Cancer um, Awareness Month. Uh, and the next slide. Oh, my name is Ann Chang. I'm the Deputy CMO and Chief Integration Officer for Smilo. Uh, I'm a lung medical oncologist. And I um, developed this, uh, this, this series with Karen Brown and NEMG and Smilo working together to really um, uh, focus on the primary care perspective on cancer and hematology uh, and the audience for primary care clinicians. Um, and we have our uh, primary care panelists and Smilo physicians. Uh, this is a monthly series. So if you like us, then come back. Um, it's always the first Tuesday, uh, 5 to 6 p.m. virtually, and at some point perhaps in person, uh, we started last month. Uh, and really this is an opportunity to, to focus on questions that primary care may have about um, cancer topics. Uh, and we really felt that it wasn't something that where we wanted the specialist to tell primary care what they wanted to know, but really ask primary care what, what the topics are that, that you, you have questions about. So um, we're gonna go into introductions and then we'll go into a uh, case presentation with our experts uh, and really we'll would like to have about 10 minutes available for questions and answers that you may put in the chat as we're going along. Um, or, or ask um, at that time. So I'm gonna introduce Karen Brown um, first. Uh, Karen, if you can say a few words and then, and, and then um, start with the intros of our faculty. Sure, no, I, I just want to thank you, Anne, and of course, all of our Smilo folks um, for sharing with us. Um, you know, we are always stronger together and new cancer is can be a really uh, tough time for our patients and for us to support our patients. So I, I think the more that we can do to coordinate um, both officially and unofficially and formally and informally between us, um, the, the better care that our patients will receive. And I would also like to point out that this evening's panel is largely on um, the, the uh, New Haven region. Um, so we're hoping to kind of highlight on um, different regions. Um, and I'll introduce um, Jill Benatoski, who is one of our star NEMG primary care clinicians. Um, Jill attended medical school at the University of Connecticut and completed residency uh, in primary care um, general internal medicine at Mass General. Uh, she returned to Connecticut to practice general internal medicine, um, where I met her. She was an assistant clinical professor and working closely to educate a lot of the residents um, who were training uh, with us at Yale um, in the ambulatory setting. Uh, she and her practice joined a Northeast Medical Group in 2018. Um, and are uh, clearly provide excellent patient care. Uh, we get um, constant demands um, to see how many more patients they can follow uh, because um, people love them and they do such a good job taking care of patients. Um, she's additionally now the medical director for um, University of New Haven, um, so engaging in some student health as well. And I'll pass it back to you to introduce our specialist. Okay. So Rachel Greenup is an associate professor um, uh, of surgery. She's a breast surgeon. She's our chief of breast surgery. And she uh, came, from, came from Wisconsin uh, where she did her res residency and then went on to do her fellowship at the MGH, uh, Dana Farber and Brigham, um, and actually came uh, before joining Yale from Duke where she founded the Duke Breast Cancer Outcomes Research Group. And, um, and she has uh, been here, how long now? I think it's Rachel. Three and a half. Yes. And, and has a real focus on um, care of women with, young women with breast cancer and early onset breast cancer and health equities. Um, Sarah Shellhorn is a colleague of mine, uh, Associate Professor of Medicine, Chief Ambulatory Officer for, uh, for Smilo. And she came from, uh, she did her residency at Beth Israel Deaconess in Boston and, and came, did her fellowship at MD Anderson. Uh, and she is really interested in, in lots of things around patient care, um, using technology to help uh, patients optimize adherence to oral therapies and you know, uh, studying patient reported outcomes. Um, and she's the physician leader of our faculty academic practice. 
and uh, also very interested in early onset breast cancer. Um, Waji Zahir, another colleague, associate professor, professor of medicine. Uh, he is the medical director for our Smilo Cancer Care Center in Guilford. Uh, and he trained at Yale Affiliated Hospital for Residency. He was chief resident and then did his fellowship at Cornell University uh, Met while Medical College and uh, is a fellow of the American College of Physicians and also very interested in long-term care of patients with breast cancer. So without further ado, with our distinguished faculty panel, I'll hand it over to Jill. Good evening, everyone, and thank you. Thank you for the introductions, Anne and Karen. We in NAMG um, who are seeing patients uh, see and have conversations with over 100,000 women regarding breast cancer screening annually, and we order hundreds of mammograms. So this topic is very important to us. Um, we utilize the health maintenance tab in EPIC as an opportunity to remind ourselves and our patients of when their mammograms are due and to make sure they're done in a timely fashion. And one of the focuses we wanted to make sure we took on tonight was recognizing those who are at increased risk of breast cancer and might need earlier or more advanced level screening. So with that, I'll start our case with a 35-year-old nulliparous female with a history of obesity, PCOS, and Raynaud's who presents for advice regarding breast cancer screening and prevention as her mother, maternal aunt, and premenopausal older sister all have a history of breast cancer. So questions regarding this case are what screening imaging is recommended in light of her family history and at what intervals? Is genetic testing indicated? What tests and how is it best to arrange that? And what, if any, preventative strategies are recommended regarding prophylaxis or surgery? And so Dr. Greenup is going to uh, take this on. Thank you, Rachel. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. Um, so Breast cancer screening has been a topic of great controversy for many years, and it flares up in the lay press every three to five years. Every different society has specific guidelines, but the next slide will show you that the U.S. Preventive Task Force guideline um, demonstrates that women under 50 screening should be made on an individual basis and take patient context into account, so certainly a strong family history we recommend women begin screening with annual mammogram and or ultrasound based on the youngest age of the individual and their family at diagnosis. So for example, in this 35-year-old woman who had a history of a mother, maternal aunt, and premenopausal older sister, we would think about the ages of their diagnoses and recommend screening for her about 10 years younger than that earliest diagnosis. The U.S. Preventive Task Force guidelines were most controversial because they did recommend that screening could be considered in every other year uh, in women 50 to 74. And they um, actually said that there was potentially no benefit to clinical breast exam. Patients ask us about this a lot. I still encourage women who are comfortable doing a monthly breast exam to do so, regardless of what the data shows. We still meet many women who find their own breast cancer. The next slide shows the American Cancer Society guidelines. And again, this is what most of us in academic programs uh, adhere to, which includes annual screening for women 40 to 44. Again, lifetime risk should be considered. Um, and then uh, switching to mammograms every two years as women are 55 and older, again, depending on risk. The next slide shows uh, the American Society of Breast Surgeons position statement on screening mammogram. And this came out in 2019 in response to differing uh, opinions around frequency and type of imaging for average risk women. And these guidelines are really thoughtful in considering not only family history, but also breast density and the value of supplemental imaging. And I recommend if anyone's interested, you can go on the ASBS website and look at these in detail. But the next slide will outline um, when women, certainly who have breast cancer, we, we see a finding on mammogram followed by ultrasound plus minus biopsy. Next slide. If there's any concern about density or family history being um, exacerbated, inclusion of MRI, 3D mammography, screening ultrasound or supplemental imaging, such as contrast enhanced mammography, which is a less common currently across the country, but we're hoping to launch that in our Smilo network in the near future. 
there's opportunities to do so without uh, pushback from insurance coverage. In terms of uh, screening or testing for a hereditary cancer syndrome, next slide, we typically uh, depended on the NCCN guidelines. And these, uh, as many of you know, were really based on both a personal history of breast cancer and a family history of breast cancer. It looked at uh, potential for genetic testing for BRCA1 and 2 mutation carriers, any woman uh, 45 or younger, women younger than 50 with first, second, or third degree relatives, women with family history of both breast and um, GYN cancers, including ovarian or fallopian tube or primary peritoneal. It did account for um, bilateral breast cancer, triple negative phenotype under age 60, and um, individuals with strong family history of melanoma and pancreas cancer. Next slide. Again, the American Society of Breast Surgeons did uh, update our genetic uh, testing for hereditary breast cancer guidelines to say that any woman with a known breast cancer should have access to uh, genetic counseling and potential testing, knowing that uh, broad genetic testing panels can include variants of un unknown significant that can cause um, difficulty in discussions and are often not clinically actionable. And I think that brings us to our screening key points. And the uh, final is that average risk women who need screening can be considered for every other year starting at age 50, but all current guidelines recommend we account for patient family history and personal history, including biopsies. We should consider screening every year in women 40 or over. Um, it's important to screen women 25 and over for higher risk of breast cancer and include that on their imaging. It will help our radiology colleagues think about supplemental ultrasound and or MRI related to breast density. Um, and again, we do have a robust program at the breast center that includes breast surgery EPPs who can help absorb these patients if they need a um, medical home for their breast cancer care. Thank you. So now we're, we're taking this same patient and um, moving her through the process here. Now she's presenting at age 49 with a palpable breast mass. And so when we come to this case, the questions that come up are, what are the appropriate imaging orders? Um, and what is the appropriate method for referring for biopsy? Should the patient go straight to surgery? Should be a radiological biopsy? And if the, if the biopsy is positive, What's the order of referral and when should she see oncology in relationship to her definitive surgery? I believe Rachel is taking this one as well. Yeah, so certainly a 49-year-old woman with a palpable breast mass initially should undergo diagnostic mammogram, a diagnostic ultrasound, and certainly consideration of MRI based on breast density is very reasonable. I typically have this discussion with our radiologists. Sometimes the reports will say things such as extremely dense breast MRI is recommended. Other times it's valuable to think about the pros and cons of MRI in partnership with the patient herself. Um, at Yale, uh, we do refer these women for a biopsy and or second opinion if the imaging is done outside so that women can get both a face-to-face -face consultation with a provider in our breast center and also have a formal review of their uh, screening imaging that led to the, the workup or the, the area of concern. Screening imaging being their uh, annual imaging that caught the abnormality and diagnostic being the additional workup that led to diagnosis. Um, when we think about breast surgery, and typically our breast surgeons are the first uh, frontline providers that see these patients, there are many options. So women um, who are eligible with small breast cancers can undergo lumpectomy or mastectomy if they are found to not have a hereditary cancer syndrome, and we know their risk of local recurrence remains very low. Uh, lumpectomies are shorter surgeries. We can do that in conjunction with aquaplastic surgery, either a reduction or a lift, we typically recommend that women uh, less than 70 years old with uh, triple negative or um, HER2 positive breast cancers uh, 
have lumpectomy followed by radiation. There are some exceptions in older women with favorable hormone receptor positive breast cancers where radiation can be safely omitted. The recovery time is shorter. I always tell patients they get back to their lives a little sooner and the complication rate is low. When we think about mastectomy, um, it's a bigger surgery. When we add reconstruction, that's a second really important layer from a psychosocial perspective, but does not contribute to improved cancer outcomes. Many women with small tumors after mastectomy won't need radiation. Um, they can be uh, exposed to several surgeries and or revisions, and there's a higher rates of complications, especially if patients are smokers, have diabetes or other comorbidities. Next slide. And these are just some pictures that everyone on the call is aware of. Lumpectomy means we're removing the tumor with negative margins, typically following by radiation. Next slide. We used to be very reliant on radiology, putting a wire in. Next slide. And now we have the um, improved sophisticated technology like radioactive seeds or tag localizers that women can have placed up to five days prior to their lumpectomy um, without needing to have the wire uh, out of their breast the day of surgery. We also have good data. It's more comfortable. Patients have better satisfaction and their margin rates are improved with smaller resection specimens. Next slide. When we think about mastectomy, obviously that's removing all of the breast tissue. It can happen with or without reconstruction. We have a great group of reconstructive surgeons across the region um, that do both implant-based and micro vascular reconstruction, and we're doing an increasing number of uh, media implant reconstruction, which does consolidate the recovery time for our patients. Next. I think one of the things that comes up a lot when I meet women, especially our younger patients like this one, is the discussion about whether there's benefit of removing their healthy opposite breast through a prophylactic mastectomy on the contralateral side. And the rates of this has actually tripled in the last few decades, um, probably related to cultural and kind of pop culture uh, conversations. We know that after one breast cancer, a woman's risk of a contralateral cancer is low. It's between 0.1 and 0.5% per year. And that removing a healthy breast outside of a hereditary cancer syndrome does not improve survival. And there is also an associated higher risk when we do more surgery inherent to things like uh, bleeding infection, but ultimately our patients do report that sometimes cosmetic outcomes and uh, peace of mind are reasons that prompt them to pursue a double mastectomy. Next slide. When women need radiation, this is external beam radiation. It's painless. They usually get five days a week for one to 10 weeks. Um, it's cumulative, so side effects tend to come later or towards the end. This is things like sunburning, fatigue, um, low risk of secondary cancers. Next slide. Then there can be swelling, redness, cough, shortness of breath. Some of this related to the site that receives the radiation, but um, our radiation colleagues have uh, improved techniques to avoid injury to heart and lungs, and they continue to work towards shorter abbreviated courses. Rachel, if we could just go back to the beginning of the case with the, um, you don't have to go all the way back in the slides, but just about how you would advise this woman with regard to options prior to her developing her cancer in terms of surgical prophylactic surgery or medical therapeutics, prophylactic medicine, medications, what is the, um, how, do, how do you phrase that conversation with her given her risk and whether or not if she has a known mutation or does not have a mutation, but a profound family history? Yeah, so it's a complicated discussion. I think uh, ideally women will come in early in the process before they're kind of ready to sign up for surgery. Um, I first start by taking a good family history and getting a sense of the level of uh, family member involvement, at what age family members are diagnosed, and how those family members have um, survived or, or not survived their breast cancer. We do see families where there's many, many women with breast cancer, but they're all diagnosed in the postmenopausal setting with screen detected, very favorable um, cancers. And then we see women who have a myriad of young women and their family diagnosed with very highly aggressive breast cancers. 
where the it's probably more time sensitive as certainly a woman with this strong family history, having a mother, maternal aunt and older sister, I would refer her for genetic testing. Ideally, we refer an affected family member first, because if that person's negative, less likely that the individual in front of us would be a mutation carrier. Um, again, screening should start about 10 years younger than the earliest family member was diagnosed. And um, my practice for these high-risk patients, although it, it is uh, candidly controversial, is to to both uh, 3D mammogram screening, ultrasound, alternating with annual MRI. So we're staggering imaging that's being looked at um, every six months. We do see that some women get fatigued. So it's a shared decision. We work with them together about what, what feels good. I have patients that feel very reassured when their imaging is normal. And I have patients that uh, probably overestimate their risk of breast cancer the more imaging we do. So it's important to be thoughtful about how it affects their experience. Um, if she was postmenopausal, uh, typically the breast tissue becomes fatty or replaced. We all know that 3D mammography um, becomes, uh, becomes easier to interpret. And um, I think especially if postmenopausal women are nearing end of life or they have multiple comorbidities, discussions around uh, reducing the frequency of imaging is valuable. Um, and uh, we do talk to women about chemo prevention if their family history is very high. Certainly if women have a, both a known BRCA1 uh, mutation and strong family history or BRCA2 mutation, similarly, we, we have good discussions about risk reducing surgery, both from a mastectomy perspective and also from a GYN perspective. Thank you. I, I think Sarah had her hand raised and she wanted to comment as well. Thanks. I just wanted, I, yes, thank you, Jill. I just wanted to add to that, that sometimes in women who are at particularly high risk, but don't wish to go the, the surgical route, um, chemo prevention is a possibility and chemo prevention sounds much scarier, scarier than it actually is. Um, but chemo prevention just basically means tamoxifen or sometimes aromatase inhibitors, which reduce the risk of developing a breast cancer somewhere a uh, relative risk of 30 to 50% um, over whatever time period they're taking it. And even past that time frame, the, um, the issue there, the issue there, excuse me, what is that that relative risk reduction may not translate into a large absolute risk reduction. And that can get a little bit complicated, but it's certainly something that we, we do on occasion um, for people who are interested. Thank you. So I'll we'll take our patient who unfortunately has surgery and is found to have a stage 2A invasive ductal carcinoma. The tumor is 2.5 centimeters in grade three, does not involve any lymph nodes, and is ERPR positive and HER2 negative. And so we are going to now engage in discussion about treatment. If she's premenopausal, what is her appropriate um, adjuvant treatment and what factors are considered? How is this different if she's postmenopausal, and how long should she be on adjuvant hormonal therapy? And uh, Dr. Shellhorn's going to take it away. Right. So breast cancer treatment in ten minutes, no problem. Um, the 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 initial approach, and, and Rachel did a really lovely job going through the def the definitive local management of breast cancer. Um, when we think about breast cancer, there are really three different modalities, each of which has a different concern. Um, and so very broadly speaking, and I know I'm jumping into the next slide a little bit, but very broadly speaking, surgery, the purpose of surgery is, is, is to take out the cancer and the affected lymph nodes, the areas that we know contain cancer. The purpose of radiation is to mop up behind the surgeon to, to get rid of any micro uh, micro microscopic disease that might reside in the breast or the, or the axilla or other lymph nodes. Um, and then the purpose of medical oncology or systemic therapy is really to reduce the risk of developing metastatic disease in the long run. So we all have very different concerns. The sequencing of treatments can be different depending on the clinical circumstance. Sometimes surgery is done per first, and this is particularly helpful to figure out what it is exactly that we're dealing with. What's the size of the cancer? How many lymph nodes are involved? Um, you really get a full pathologic picture of the cancer. And if that is going to be used to determine systemic therapy or the need for radiation later on down the road, that can be helpful. Sometimes we use a neoadjuvant approach, meaning 
before surgery to give some sort of systemic therapy, such as chemotherapy. And this is used in generally in more aggressive cancers or very locally advanced cancers. Um, when we know that chemotherapy is going to be needed and we don't need that additional pathology to determine what chemotherapy regimen to use. So just wanted to give a, a quick word on adjuvant versus neoadjuvant. And then we'll dive into all of that pathologic gobbledygook that Jill told us about in terms of this patient's um, biopsy results. Um, before we do that, however, I've already mentioned um, over on the right what the roles of surgery, radiation, and medical therapy are. Um, patients often want to know what their stage is. In fact, almost 100% of the time. Um, and stage can be thought of in one of two ways. There's the anatomic stage, which relies on the size of the tumor and the presence or absence of lymph nodes and their number to determine how locally advanced a cancer is. More recently, we started incorporating some of those things um, that were mentioned in the biopsy report that Jill, that Jill read earlier, including the grade, which in this case was grade three, the estrogen receptor and the progesterone receptor status and the HER2 status. And we can incorporate those features of the cancer into the tumor size and the lymph node status to come up with what the final stage is. And stage correlates roughly with prognosis. So it gets us now, the patient's going to have surgery, the patient's, if the, if, assuming the patient has a lumpectomy, she'll need radiation. How do we decide what kind of medical therapy um, we're going to recommend for this patient? So next slide. We first look at the grade. Grade is a measure, broadly speaking, of how aggressive the cancer cell looks under the microscope. It's incorporating a couple of different things, including the architecture, nuclear grade, um, and speed of replication. Um, and it gives us a sense, the higher the grade, the more aggressive we may need to be, i.e. the higher grade the more likely the chemo is, that chemo is going to be recommended. Next slide. We get into the estrogen and progesterone receptors. So the vast majority, 75-ish percent of all breast cancers are fueled at least in part by the female hormones, estrogen and progesterone. And so the presence of estrogen or progesterone near the cancer can lead to uh, more uncontrolled growth. So estrogen and progesterone positive cancers, um, estrogen and progesterone receptor positive cancers um, are fueled by hormones, which leads us to talk about some sort of anti-hormonal therapy um, and interfering with that interaction between the ligand and the receptor can lead to decreased uh, gene expression and therefore decreased cell proliferation in the long run. So that's the, the reason behind these hormone type therapies or rather anti-hormone type therapies that we recommend for patients who have this type of breast cancer. Um, you've heard of these drugs. You probably have hundreds of patients on these drugs. Tamoxifen works as a competitive antagonist of estrogen and progesterone, six in, sits in the pocket of the receptor and prevents breast cancers from, uh, from growing or breast cells in general from being able to grow. Aromatase inhibitors, on the other hand, um, prevent the peripheral aromatization of steroids into uh, testosterone and into, uh, of rather testosterone into estrogen um, and prevent the body from being able to make estrogen. And so you remove the ligand entirely. Um, so there's nothing to bind to the receptor itself. And the final thing that we look at is the HER2 status. HER2 is a member of the EGFR family of uh, surface receptors. Um, and it can be either normal, also called negative, or it can be positive. And it can be uh, positive in one of two ways. It can be overexpressed on the surface of the cell, or it can be amplified in the nucleus uh, with lots of additional copies of the HER2 encoding DNA. HER2 positive cancers in general are more aggressive. They, in general, require chemotherapy. Um, and oftentimes we use chemotherapy first in this setting. You may have heard of the name triple negative breast cancer. Triple negative just means estrogen receptor is negative, progesterone receptor is negative, HER2 is negative, one, two, three, triple negative. Next slide, please. 
Um, Jill, in, in our preparation for uh, this meeting, Jill uh, shared a risk, uh, shared a, a story of a patient who came in wanting to discuss her number um, with her primary care doctor. And, and number in this case often refers to something called the Oncotype DX, which is a recurrence score. It's a number on a scale of zero to 100. And it is a number that is calculated by looking at the gene expression of 21 cancer-specific genes. It goes into a patented algorithm by this company, Genomic Health, and the number, the recurrence scores is spit out. So it, that number can be on a scale of zero to 100. It's a complicated, nuanced uh, conversation with patients, but in general, if that number is 25 or lower, patients may not benefit from chemotherapy. And so chemotherapy is likely not to be recommended. If that number is higher than 25 or 26 and up, there needs to be a more uh, detailed conversation about the use of chemotherapy. So this is a test that, that we send to determine whether or not a patient needs chemotherapy. Um, it does correlate a little bit to, to prognosis, um, but the real purpose of this test is to determine whether or not we need to use chemotherapy to reduce the risk of micrometastatic disease and subsequent distant relapse and at some point in the future. Next slide. Um, I don't expect you to actually be able to read this slide, but the there are a lot of different regimens. Um, and your friendly neighborhood breast oncologist, oncologist would be more than happy to discuss any of these chemotherapy regimens with you. Um, I, I put this up just to show that there are a lot of different regimens with a lot of different side effects, a lot of different schedules. Um, and um, that's our job to, to really talk through risks and benefits, potential side effects, potential toxicities. Mainstays of treatment for breast cancer include taxanes, so taxol. Uh, taxatier, abraxane, those are some commonly used drugs, sometimes adriamycin or doxorubicin and anthracycline, cyclophosphamide, cytoxin, and carboplatin. Um, and then if the cancer is HER2 positive, trastuzumab, also known as Herceptin, as well as other anti-HER2 targeting agents. Next slide. So this particular patient would have had most likely, given that it was a high-grade cancer, it was larger, she's premenopausal, likely to have a high-risk oncotype. So an oncotype that's higher than 26, she likely would have been recommended chemotherapy. Um, however, she also needs to go on endocrine therapy. Um, tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor um, would be indicated so just to think about who we can use these in, tamoxifen can be used in, in anyone provided they don't have a risk of uh, a, or a history of venous thromboembolism or endometrial cancer. Aromatase inhibitors can only be used in postmenopausal women. Um, and that is largely related to its mechanism. It works by blocking the peripheral aromatization in peripheral tissues, not the ovaries. But what that leads to is deprivation of estrogen in the body leading to negative feedback and the ovaries ramping up um, if, if used in the absence of ovarian suppression. So aromatase inhibitors can only be used in postmenopausal women or women who do not have ovarian function, either surgically, chemically, or otherwise. The side effects of the two drugs or the two classes of drugs are, are a little bit different. Tamoxifen could cause vasomotor motor symptoms such as hot flashes. It can cause mood changes. There is a small risk of venous thromboembolism, very small risk of uterine cancer. It can be beneficial in patients with osteoporosis and can, can lead to an increase in bone density. Aromatase inhibitors, on the other hand, lead to this low estrogen state. So it's kind of menopause part two. Um, it can cause vasomotor symptoms such as hot flashes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, um, accelerated bone loss. And so we monitor bone density very closely in these patients, usually every other year. Um, it can lead to increased cholesterol as well. Um, in terms of monitor monitoring, there's really no monitoring for tamoxifen other than
into uh, determining whether or not we should extend endocrine therapy past five years. Um, the slides have disappeared. I'd be happy to take some questions until the slides return, or we could just go straight into the next uh, phase of the case. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, we're gonna move into survivorship and new symptoms. So our patient is now 54 years old. She's tolerating her adjuvant hormonal therapy. And we'd like to have a discussion about what risks should we as primary care physicians be aware of, those being endocrine, cardiac, pulmonary, psychological, and what testing should the primary care physician be prepared to order for those patients. And in addition, um, after, after that conversation, eight years later, our patient presents with new onset of back, uh, back pain of four weeks duration, which she originally attributed to a strenuous session of gardening, but rather than improving as would be expected, the pain is worsening. So this would lead us into discussion, considering her breast cancer history, what are the appropriate next steps in diagnosis and management of her new onset of symptoms given her history? And Dr. Zahir is kindly gonna take this on. Thank you. Right. Thank you for including me in this conversation. So this is, I'll take your second question first. You know, this is, uh, you know, any kind of workup for a patient with history of breast cancer should be based on what was their underlying risk and what are the symptoms. And obviously this lady is having persistent back pain issues. So we need to have it worked up to make sure that there's nothing, you know, we that we work it up for whether it's related to breast cancer or related to a treatment or related to another uh, etiology. So if she's having persistent back pain, she will uh, have a workup that could include x-rays or well, if there's persistent pain in a particular location, an MRI, or if there are diffuse symptoms, CT scan or a PET scan. And if we find some abnormality that is highly suspicious based on the radiology data, then we have to biopsy. At the time of any time of any time we feel that there is a, a possibility of a recurrence, we need to biopsy that for a variety of reasons. Uh, first reason is we want to confirm that this is indeed metastatic breast cancer, or is this another malignancy? And also we need to test for all those markers that Dr. McGillian has mentioned, you know, the estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, HER2 receptors, and also additional molecular biomarkers that we use these days for metastatic disease. Another uh, issue with the uh, metastases is that um, bone metastases are usually seen in estrogen receptor positive patients, whereas brain metastases are more common in HER2 positive or triple negative patients. And anytime a patient is diagnosed with metastatic disease, uh, these days we have a lot of choices and we have a lot of treatments, additional treatments that can be very helpful. And they are still uh, trying to convert this into a chronic disease rather than uh, a death sentence. And then we have to assess the patient for, the, for distress, which requires a lot of help on part of uh, medical providers as well as uh, home providers. So uh, we all know, and that's why we have gathered today that best care for any patient is uh, good collaboration between a primary care and an oncologist, uh, which we do this all the time. And I've had the pleasure of doing this with Jill for a number of years. So acute toxicity usually is taken care of by medical oncology, but chronic toxicities are uh, shared between primary care and, and medical oncologist. And any woman who has been treated with endocrine therapy, especially the aromatase inhibitors, we know about bone health, we discuss those issues. And many of these patients are place prophylactically also on bisphosphonates, uh, which uh, is an agent that also, uh, that helps with bone health, but also may decrease the risk of uh, disease recurrence in the bones. We all know about the side effects of adriamycin. We do not usually reach that dosage that causes problems with the heart, but we usually still check it in the adjuvant setting. Uh, Anti-HER2 therapy has, uh, potential for cardiac complications also, but most of those issues are temporary and they resolve with discontinuation of therapy. We have an excellent cardio-oncology program that actually helps us out in care of these patients in some decision-making process, whether to treat or not to treat. 
Pneumonitis uh, is uh, another risk that can happen with chemotherapy, that can happen with radiation therapy, that is happening these days with immune therapy also. Uh, it's relatively uncommon, uh, but has but may require steroid therapy at some point. Neuropathy is one of the most common chronic uh, side effects that we hear about. Uh, most commonly in breast cancer patients, Taxol is the, is the culprit, although in other malignancies, oxaliplatin is uh, more notorious for that uh, side effect. There are certain medications that actually help with some symptoms. Uh, we actually have uh, a physical therapy department that actually focuses on neuropathy and has been really successful in helping out with this chronic uh, uh, problem. Uh, psychological health is very important uh, in any uh, breast cancer or any cancer survivor. Uh, and with time, as, as, as uh, we have improved on chemotherapy, we have improved on side effects, we have tried to cut back on surgeries, we have tried to cut back on chemo certain types of chemotherapy, the financial toxicity continues to increase because of the increased cost of treatment and increased cost of taking care of these patients. So coming back to you, your first question, how often this person should be followed uh, if they do not have metastatic disease? Normally speaking, the NCCN guidelines uh, uh, say that we need to see the patients one, one to four times a year per year for five years and decreasing frequency again based on their, um, their risk and uh, again, based on their symptoms also. We are actually working on a long-term care plan at the, at the Yale Spilo Center, trying to see what is the best way to transition back to primary care after five years and what type of patient should that be and what, based on their original pathology as well as uh, need for continuing care. Uh, patients also need periodic screening for family history and genetic testing uh, because the genetic testing also can change in a number of years and new additional testing may be required. We are all familiar with the lymphedema management, uh, which is uh, which can be a problem, but those problems are decreasing, uh, thankfully, to less uh, invasive surgery. And we have good physical therapists that are available for those uh, management of lymphedema. Again, the one of the required radiology is the yearly mammogram, unless patient has had bilateral mastectomy. There's actually no indication for any other testing for routine testing in the absence of clinical signs and symptoms suggestive of a recurrence. And uh, again, we have uh, good long-term care plans that we are working on, and we have a lot of these support services uh, that are available at the Spilo uh, Cancer Center. I will not go into individual details, but all of them are providing additional help. We have the extended care clinic for off hours so that the patient cannot should not go to the emergency room and can uh, go uh, and can bypass the emergency room. We have the multidisciplinary care that we are trying to get patient an appointment uh, together with the surgeon and medical oncologist and radiation oncologist and other supportive uh, 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 agencies. Uh, we are trying to also get next day access, which we have been successful to some extent. And then I want to mention that the oncology pharmacy has been one of the mainstay that are available in all, almost all of our offices that are readily available to discuss interactions and discuss any changes as needed. And thank you very much. That was terrific. I'm going to um, just lead a question and answer session. Um, although we don't have anybody that's offered any question and answers um, through our uh, Zoom connection. So if you are thinking of asking a question, by all means, um, put it in the Q&A. Um, and otherwise, I, I, I have a, a couple of kind of logistic questions. Um, so the first thing was in a cancer survivor, a breast cancer survivor who has some new symptoms, whether it's back pain or maybe a lump they feel, subcutaneous lump, is, you know, you said to assess um, their risk of recurrence based on their initial um, cancer. And, and that is one thing that can really stump us in primary care. So, you know, what I find is whenever I see the name of the oncologist who treated the patient and I recognize the name and I pick up the phone, 
they have this encyclopedic knowledge of exactly what means what as far as what they were treated with and you know their markers and um so i'm, I'm wondering is is that something that's going to be addressed in this care plan or is that kind of just the right thing to do is to pick up the phone and, and call an oncologist how how should we proceed um when we do suspect a, a late recurrence or um of cancer I think, Karen, it's a great question. Waji, you, go ahead. Sorry. No, you're going to go ahead. I, I basically, you know, I, I would say that, you know, picking up the phone is always very helpful. <laughs> uh, that's uh, it's the best care possible for the patient. And again, uh, I've uh, known Jill and her group for a long time, and I, I get these calls all the time. And I think that really improves the care that tells that directs which, which test needs to be done. And there are, and we are actually, you know, better position in a sense to tell as to what tests should be done first that sometimes saves money and as well as unnecessary tests also and unnecessary anxiety also looking at certain person certain patient if we look at a certain uh, abnormality we will say you know it's highly unlikely related mm -hmm. to breast cancer and that may alleviate the anxiety right away and, uh, yeah, so I, I, and I would echo exactly that that same sentiment. Um, it's uh, we love to hear from primary care doctors. Um, you know, we recognize that we're not up to date on the latest and greatest antihypertensives, uh, antihypertensives, and I can't name anti-diabetes medications except for metformin. So the um, it, it really has to be a collaboration. Um, the we do come across any number of patients that say, I had cancer, my shoulder hurts, I need all the scans. Um, and, and so it's a careful balance of what that patient's underlying risk is, which really is our job. And, and what's the likelihood that this represents a metastatic or a neoplastic process. And the, the thing that I find to be helpful when explaining to patients at least is cancer, usually if cancer is gonna come back, it's gonna meet the three Ps. It's going to be a symptom that's perplexing. You don't know why you have it. You, you didn't just shovel your driveway for three hours the day before. Um, it's persistent. It's there. It doesn't go away. And it's progressive and it's getting worse. And so those are the three things that kind of help us determine what we need to be more worried about. We're not going to worry about something if it's been there for an hour and a half. We're going to worry about something if it's been there for weeks and it really isn't behaving like it should if this were some other non-neoplastic process. Um, and then deciding what test is best to do really does kind of require a knowledge about the biology of the cancer um, and where is this most likely to show up. Some subtypes are more likely to actually show up in the brain and, and we have to have, that's that's kind of our job to, to catch that. So we, we love to hear from primary care doctors. And what if I don't know who the oncologist is or was, the patient's moved from out of state, or perhaps the oncologist has retired? Mm -hmm. Is there call a- me. Call Waji, call Waji. <laughs> all right, it's going out to all of our New Haven clinicians. You've got it. All right, that is excellent. No, we're always but happy to help. Uh, we're all, we're happy all, to all on InBasket, we're all on my chart and happy to, to take a look. And we may not be able to give you the right answer, but we're, we're uh, especially if we don't have all the information, but, but that's not a reason we have long-term people who can, who, who we're happy to see and kind of assess their underlying risk. Thank you. And that is, again, it is so helpful to say to a patient, you know, I, I, I'm not concerned that this can that this represents recurrent cancer. And I also spoke to Thanks. your oncologist and um, they share that it, it actually is, is incredibly helpful. So thank you for that collaboration. Um, I, looks like I, we don't have other questions. So Jill, maybe you have a question. I, I was going to ask just because um, in talking about survivorship or even in the process, it is very anxiety provoking. And we are often called upon to prescribe anti-anxiety meds or antidepressants. And if you could just comment, if you have your preferred, if you if there's certain SSRIs that you prefer, certain ones you want us to avoid, if you could maybe discuss that, that would be great. Sure. Um, so it, it, some of it depends on what the patient is actually taking from a cancer standpoint. Tamoxifen has some theoretical interactions with certain SSRIs, yes. such as uh, paroxetine, sertraline, fluoxetine, 
kind of all of the go-tos. Um, it, it, they can, um, they are CYP2D6 inhibitors, which can inhibit tamoxifen's uh, forming its active metabolite, which is called endoxifen. Little CME, not that anyone actually cares, but the, the, um, so we try not to co prescribe those. However, uh, venlafaxine, so the SNRI, and I use citalopram or escitalopram. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're really look, looking for an SSRI, those are good go tos that don't have the same degree of interaction. There are no interactions for aromatase inhibitors um, that we worry about. Um, you know, the, the question of benzos is always one that we, we try to minimize as much as we can. We can use it as a bridge, especially around diagnosis when we're just kind of in this very high anxiety time. Um, but I generally do not favor long-term use of benzodiazepines. Agreed. Thank you. Yeah, no, and that's really what I wanted to Preaching get to, to the, the choir. choir. <laughs> yes. For sure. And there is psycho oncologists that are hard to get, but they're available and uh, they are very helpful. And I think it's again, uh, the best thing is to have the good interaction between the primary care and the oncologist. And that is very helpful when you are helping us take care of the anxiety parts. You know, that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. One of my personal favorite opportunities is when a patient comes to me for a second opinion on whether they should continue an aromatase inhibitor. I bet you <laughs> love that. They, they hurt all over. Well, actually, what I have found is one of my most important um, tools is chart review. So I simply go back to the note and, and very often it's actually outlined like the risk of recurrence with this medicine, the risk of recurrence without this medicine. It's part of the counseling that you do is often documented. And, and it's enormously helpful to me as I explore the patient's thinking, obviously I'm, I'm not gonna give a clear directive um, for that. Um, but I don't know if you have um, hints for us in um, management of some of the symptoms so that people can continue to take it. Are, are there anything that you would like us to know about that? Oh, such a great question. Um, so exercise is actually one of the things. So musculoskeletal complaints, arthralgias related to aromatase inhibitors, is a very common side effect. Um, probably 30 to 50% experience some, some degree, not necessarily a severe uh, amount, but, but some degree. Um, and exercise, weight-bearing exercise has so many benefits just from cardiovascular risk and from bone density standpoints that in addition to being shown in clinical trials to reduce uh, aromatase inhibitor induced musculoskeletal complaints um, is, is incredibly helpful. Other things, acupuncture has been shown to be helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and duloxetine has been shown to be helpful. And that's in phase three clinical trials, placebo controlled. Um, those are um, the most kind of uh, studied ways. But there are other things that that Waji and I can do from moving from one aromatase to another for whatever reason. Sometimes switching helps. Sometimes taking a break to figure out is it really the AI that's doing it. Sometimes um, switching to tamoxifen, which has fewer musculoskeletal complaints, and all of that that conversation really does need to include what's the underlying risk. Is this somebody who's an incredibly high risk that we want to give the absolute fully loaded endocrine therapy for as long as we possibly can? Or is this somebody with a very low risk cancer where the difference between two endocrine therapy strategies is probably minimal and a month off is not going to make a big deal, make a big difference. So if you elicit that history, it's, it's, we love getting those kind of, Hey, heads up. So-and-so is really having a tough time. Um, and, and we can certainly explore options. Um, and sometimes people just can't tolerate it. Mm -hmm. It happens and, and you have to do the risks and benefits and, and it's our job to make sure that we understand all of the benefits and it's up to the patient to decide whether or not it's something that they can tolerate. And, and many people can't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. I like that permission not to tolerate understanding risks. It's exactly right. It's, it's, you know, we just have to explore it and make sure it's an informed decision. 
So uh, we are drawing to the end of our hour. I'll, I'll ask one qu final question, which is, is there anything you just really wish the primary care clinicians knew um, in our relationship uh, with you? And then I'm gonna ask Jill if there's anything she really wishes that her oncology team knew for um, referrals. I think I can, I, I'll, 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 I'll volunteer again. <laughs> um, I, I think we've already hit on probably my, my uh, favorite thing, which is pick up the phone, mm -hmm. send me a my chart. Um, I'll give you my cell phone number. Um, the, we want to be involved, especially when it comes to more advanced stages, when people have metastatic disease, goals of care conversation, prognosis. We really do try very hard to, to explore those with our patients and, and document it. Um, but we want to be involved um, with all decisions. And sometimes it may make sense not to be doing um, evidence-based primary healthcare maintenance um, in patients who have advanced cancer. And we're happy to, to talk about it, but then in other cases, it may make sense for somebody to have a colonoscopy, even if they have metastatic breast cancer. We're, we love to participate in those conversations. Absolutely. You know, yes, it's good to have a good connection. That's very important. It's very helpful, honestly. And it's very helpful also for non-oncologic care uh, to be good also. So that's why we definitely need you and we need primary care physicians to be deeply involved in the care of patients. Good. All right. And Jill, your perspective, and then we will bring it to a close. I, I think I agree with everything that's been said. And I think just knowing that our oncology colleagues are ready and willing to pick up the phone for us, and we're willing to pick up the phone for them to allay a patient's fears, um, because there are times when, you know, we get asked, what is the onco, <laughs> Le onco <laughs> number? Uh -huh. What does the number mean? You know, those kinds of conversations that are sort of beyond our expertise, um, but that we can be helpful in other ways. So thank you. All right. So um, thank you to all of you um, and to everybody who attended. This has been a very helpful conversation. Um, please stay tuned for a few final seconds because there is a um, one more slide that is a kind of very quick evaluation and completing that is helpful for the series. Um, and do you have any closing comments? No, this is terrific. Um, uh, the contacts are there. And then once this closes, you'll get a survey. If you could, um, if you could fill that out, that'd be helpful for us. And, and uh, tell your friends, we, we have one uh, for next week, uh, next month. Um, and actually we're scheduled throughout June. So if you enjoyed this today, just let us know, that'd be helpful. Thanks so much, everybody. And um, happy Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you.